Welcome to the seminar six of the seminar series, uh, Data Science, Machine Learning, AI, Applications and Opportunity. Uh, before I go into introducing the today's agenda and also today's panelists, one quick thing that I want to do is talk about the next webinar. So the next webinar, which will be uh, held on August 12th, Thursday at 11 a.m. EST, will be focused off application of machine learning and AI techniques in engineering design. So in design domain, and we will have uh, three distinguished panelists uh, from University of Texas at Dallas, University of Maryland, and also at Carnegie Mellon University. So Dr. Joshua Summers, Dr. Mark Fuge, and Dr. Chris McCombs, who are experts in engineering design domain and the application of machine learning and AI in that domain will be uh, the panelists and they will be talking about various research projects and various interesting work they have been doing at this domain. So with that, let's come back to the main agenda of today's presentation, which is focused on physics guided machine learning. And also the another innovative part of today's presentation is we have a few recently graduated PhD students who have worked in this domain uh, who are now on a a uh, career path of pursuing some of these uh, machine learning technologies in new applications. So before I go and introduce the panelists, what I want to do is I want to quickly set the agenda and talk about the key conceptual idea. So if you're in the engineering domain, you know that uh, there are two main modeling paradigms that are used to model any engineering systems. One, which you see on this slide is on the left-hand side, where you have a physics-based approach, what you do is you develop a set of equations to model a given phenomenon. And there are great things about physics-based modeling approach that you might have very few observations and other things, but if you develop a physics-based model based upon those observations, then that physics-based model extrapolates well beyond those observations, and it also explains everything that you want to know about that problem. On the other hand, the shortcoming of physics-based model approaches are that if your problem is complex or if you're modeling a very complex system, then you will need a lot of equations and typically this becomes cumbersome and you start making assumptions and you start making simplifications in the model. That's why sometimes the model accuracy is degraded. On the other hand, on the right hand side, you have also what is known as the data-driven machine learning based approach where you are doing input to output mapping and they are really, good models for many scenarios. One of the specific scenarios, if you have a large scale data set with you, then you can really create a highly accurate, you know, data driven models with you. But there are certain drawbacks with the machine learning models too. First of all, the drawback is, if you have a machine learning model that is trained on a specific data set, it typically will not extrapolate well beyond that training regime or outside that training principle. And the second problem is, that machine learning models might not you know, respect the physics of the problem that you have at the hand. For example, if you're modeling a UAV system in which you know, uh, generally the assumption will be that the UAV, the gravity is pointing downwards, you cannot enforce such constraints in physics based or uh, in data-driven model or machine learning model. And in some cases, you might get very weird output such as the gravity is pointing upward. So they do not respect any physics principles, they do not respect the physics of the problem, and that's another shortcoming. So when we are talking about physics guided machine learning, our basic approach is merging both the physics based model and the machine learning model together to create what is known as hybrid model or physics guided machine learning model. And the key idea behind this is to eliminate the issues and problems of the both the modeling approaches. Okay, and that's the topic of today's presentation that we have. So with that, let me introduce the main panelists of today's talk. Today we have with us Dr. Zibo Zhang, Dr. Roy Yang, Dr. Amir Behazad, and Subhendu Singh. Zibo Zhang is currently a research scientist, uh, an algorithmic engineer uh, at KLA in Milpitas, California, and he holds a PhD degree in mechanical engineering from University at Buffalo, SUNY. And he received his MS degree in mechanical engineering from SUNY Buffalo in 2017. And prior to coming to US, he worked as a mechanical engineer in China. His research interest spans area of machine learning, hybrid modeling, 
intelligent manufacturing and image processing. He is currently working on developing algorithms to detect and extract the properties of defect on the wafer, on the wafer by using image processing and machine learning approaches that are there. The second panelist that we have today is Dr. Roy Yang. Dr. Roy Yang received his you know, PhD from uh, University at B Buffalo last year itself, and he has worked mainly in using uh, hybrid physics-guided machine learning approaches for defect detection, for structural health monitoring applications, and he will be sharing some of those research with you today. The third panelist that we have uh, is Dr. Amir Bhajar, who is also currently a postdoc at Purdue University, and he got his PhD from Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department at UB, and he graduated with his BS degree in 2011 and MS degree in 2014 in me Mechanical Engineering from Sharif University of Technology, and his main research is in machine learning optimization with focuses on neuroevolution, physics-aware machine learning, and their application in collision avoidance in UAV and SWARM robotics. And the fourth panelist that we have is Subendu Singh. Uh, Subendu is currently a doctoral uh, PhD student working in my lab, and he has developed a novel Pi LSTM algorithm, which is a hybrid physics guided machine learning uh, algorithm that he has applied on a variety of problems. And he will be talking about some of those problems uh, coming forward. So, with that, let me uh, welcome the first speaker or the first panelist of today's webinar, Dr. Zivo Zhang. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, yeah, my, uh, my name is Zebo, uh, and my topic will be physics-infused hybrid machine learning model and their applications. <laughs> uh, in my presentation, I have two parts. First part is uh, introduction. I will introduce a little bit about the hybrid model. Second one, I will introduce uh, three different applications. Um, so, uh, I, I think as Dr. Rai introduced uh, the hybrid model, I think maybe you don't have a very uh, detailed uh, sense about what is hybrid model. Actually, I want to start from a very simple problem. Uh, so uh, this is an inverted pendulum. It has drag and friction, uh, and uh, it will move like this. Let me, uh, can you still see my screen? Yeah, it will move like this. And we have X, which is the position of the pendulum and the velocity and the theta. Theta is the angle of the, uh, this pendulum. And this is the omega, uh, which is the uh, uh, angle velocity of the pendulum. Uh, and we want to model this, this problem. What is our first idea? Our first idea is the white box model, which uses the physics-based model. And uh, this uses our knowledge uh, from the physics to uh, uh, model this pendulum. Uh, but the, the drawback is obvious. Uh, we have to have domain expertise and uh, uh, you have to uh, model everything in detail. Uh, but uh, the advantage is we don't need the data. Uh, and another idea is we can model it by a, a black box model, which we use only data. Uh, and uh, this is what Dr. Ryan mentioned, the bake. We use a gray box model, which is hybrid model. Uh, and we can use uh, both advantage uh, from the uh, white box model and the black box model. Um, and this is our uh, method to solve this problem. Uh, we proposed this in uh, 2020. Um, and we try to uh, we, uh, as we can see, uh, this is a uh, uh, trajectory of the, or this is the behavior of the physics. This is X, V, and theta and omega. And we try to use a physics decomposition method to decompose this kind of signal and use a, a TCN, which is a temporal convolution neural network to uh, memorize uh, this signal and use a fully connected layer to predict the behavior of the uh, uh, pendulum. 
and uh, this is our result. Uh, as we can see here, this is a, a traditional uh, method based on a, a deep neural network. Uh, it didn't involve any uh, physics, and the result you can see it's a little bit away from the uh, good result. And this is our hybrid model. Uh, you can see we have big improve. And this is also our results. Uh, this is our model. And we compare our model with several of the different kinds of uh, deep learning model, uh, which uh, these three, uh, they are pure uh, deep learning model. And these three are hybrid model, but uh, do not have our like a physics memorization uh, unit and do not have physics decomposition unit. So our model have much better uh, results than others. Uh, second application will be based on uh, additive manufacturing. Uh, this laser-based power bed fusion additive manufacturing uh, means you use a laser to melt the uh, particle and uh, uh, to melt the particle and uh, layer by layer so that you can print the part. Uh, one thing very important is this one, is the melt pool. Uh, when you move the laser and the laser melts the particle, uh, we'll have a melt pool here on the, on the part. And this, this melt pool have, uh, have strong correlation with the, uh, the, the part's quality. Uh, so we want to, uh, if we can know the behavior of the melt pool so that we can monitor or control the quality of the part. So this is the original, or this is maybe from a, a, a very easy uh, strategy to print the part uh, like this. And you can see there will be a very big defect in the middle of the part. Uh, and uh, if we can control the multiple size, we can improve the quality of the parts. Uh, thus, uh, we want to monitor the multiple. If we can predict, the, the behavior of the melt pool, we can get a better result, right? Uh, so we propose, uh, propose the, this network, which based on GAN, uh, we try to use uh, uh, the, the, the input will be the uh, process parameter, like the velocity of the uh, laser power uh, and uh, uh, the, the laser and the power of the laser will be the input. And we want to try to predict the, the melt pool. Uh, and we try to generate the melt pool. This will be our result. You can see the bottom is the ground truth. Uh, and our GAN can try to learn the melt pool. This is like a history of our generator to learn to generate the melt pool. You can see at the beginning, it will be random noise. And later on, the, the generator learned the position of the melt pool and try to learn uh, the, like a gradient. Uh, here you can see maybe just the one, the zero is binary. And try to learn the shadow, try to learn the direction of the tail. And later on, our results can, uh, you can see they are pr pretty similar. And we also evaluate the results here. Uh, uh, we use several of the matrix. You can see our result is pretty accurate. Uh, this uh, SSIM, they try to evaluate uh, the, the synthetic image and the ground truth image, if they are uh, same or not. You can see this is like 91. Uh, uh, and uh, the accuracy for the, you can see this is like an ellipse, right? The major axis, uh, accuracy is 92 and the minor one is 86.9. And we also uh, uh, try to see if our results are similar to the original one. This one is the ground truth one. And this one is our result. Uh, as we can see, uh, our results can easily find the peak. They are similar, no matter the lower peak or the higher peak.
uh, third application I will introduce is uh, human motion prediction. Uh, so this one is a pretty popular. Uh, we want, uh, why do we want to do this? Uh, so if we can do the human motion prediction, we can uh, try, uh, we can do the human behavior monitoring like this one. Uh, and we can also do the track like uh, on the street, there are some, several of the uh, camera can capture the human and uh, or in the in the autonomous car, they can try to predict the where will human be. Um, also uh, for the robotic, uh, human robotic interaction, when we know the, when we, uh, if we can predict the, the behavior of the human, we can, we can improve the strategy of the robot. Uh, thus, we predict another, uh, we propose another hybrid model. Uh, uh, we use a human dynamic model to, uh, this one is a simplified uh, of human dynamic model, uh, rather than the full model. We, uh, we use several of the assumptions, which can help us to simplify the problem. And later on, we uh, uh, combine this physics model with a, uh, encoder decoder network and this encoder decoder network based on LSTM. Um, when we use this, we can highly improve the result. This is our result comparing to state of art method. Uh, our result, most, uh, most of the time, our results can give better, uh, give our better result. And uh, uh, especially in long term, uh, like the uh, 1000, uh, millisecond, our result, result is much better than the common uh, or a traditional method. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Zibo. So let's move on to our next panelist, uh, which is uh, Dr. Roy Yang. Dr. Rai, uh, Roy has a problem with his computer. So can you uh, change sure. the order? So let's move. Yeah, uh, let's move on to the third panelist then. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Amir Mehjad for his perspective on physics guided machine learning. Do, do you see my screen? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm Amy Echad. I was a PhD student at the University of Buffalo working in Adam's lab. And my advisor was Dr. Shoma Chaudhary. I had the chance to work with Dr. Rai in physics of AI program uh, for DARPA. And my presentation is mostly about that work here. So um, let's start with the idea that we are trying to proposed here. So the problem that we are trying to solve is based on the real problem in the, uh, in the real world. So if we have these UAVs that are currently discussing to be used for package delivery, in the uh, long time, in the long future, uh, near future, there will be many of them in an urban environment when there are some buildings, some power lines and everything like that. And they may have some issues because when they are flying, they may have some uh, confrontation of each other and they may have some collision. So our question is how to avoid this collision. So what should we do to help these UAVs that's going to be a lot of them in the environment to avoid the collision? So the answer is about, uh, has actually two parts for us. One is to having better perception, better understanding of their environment and the other UAVs and their own states. And the other one is having the better decision. So for the first part is uh, my answer is through the idea of physics and very machine learning. That's the main, uh, main, main uh, topic of this presentation. And also I go a little about the revolution, which is the method that we are trying to use to find the optimal decision and optimal policy. So uh, I, I don't go through this, uh, introduction again. So the only thing I want to emphasize that we are facing the same problem that uh, Zeebo also explained, uh, finding the best model. Uh, high fidelity models sometimes have high computational cost. And more importantly, sometimes they use some states that we cannot directly observe. 
So sometimes we can rely on partial physics, which are the models that do not require these observations or they are computationally efficient to run. And what we are trying to do is to jo uh, join the high fidelity samples in the data-driven model and the low fidelity or partial physics model, which we can compute, uh, compute their output online and make the better decision. So let's see what is the special thing we did. So uh, our work here has a little um, different with what Ziba actually presented. So I came during this project that I had the chance to work with others with a slightly different architecture. So my answer to this question of what is the optimal model was about answering this, this question. What is the source of error? Why the model cannot predict everything well with just data-driven model? What is the source of error and how can we prevent it from propagating during this nonlinear uh, transformation of this model we have? So our idea was using the partial physics as a final prediction step. So by using the uh, partial physics as a final prediction step, we were sure that at least the at least the trend is going to be safe for us and the system will follow the train. So here we have two examples. One is the model that we have in the left, which called Optima is the model that we uh, proposed during the research. And the one in the right is a sequential hybrid model or sequential physics aware model. The first one, the right one uses the partial physics as an extra feature, while the other one somehow models neural network, uh, partial physics as an extra neural network, somehow tries to do that, and then makes a prediction. I go, don't go through the training process. I just explain how it helped us during this UAV collision avoidance problem. So we had two UAVs, for example. One model, uh, we have a UAV model that flies in a trajectory when everything is perfect, there's not any noise and there's not any uh, wind and air effect, it flies the trajectory perfectly. But what happens if we consider the air drag and these uh, other, uh, other physics attributes that we couldn't actually consider in our, uh, in our initial model? the trajectory will change. And if the trajectory will change, the UAVs cannot predict the correct trajectory and they may have collision. So our question was how to best uh, predict the final trajectory, the real trajectory. And for this question, we thought, okay, let's think of what is the source of error in the trajectory. The source of error in the trajectory is not necessarily uh, uh, the same case based on the different problem we are facing. So if the part of the physics that we did not consider in our partial physics is air effect, which affects the force uh, that's going to be applied in the system, maybe changing the trust of the motors can be the most uh, direct way to compensate the errors. So the idea was this, instead of just looking at the output of those high fidelity full physics samples and make the better prediction. Let's do this. Based on the situation we have, based on the inputs we have, let's change the actual trust that's applied in the motor. And then this change, this uh, modified trust can be applied and then we make the trajectory prediction in a, uh, in a, in a better way. And our, our results actually also supported this idea and showed that, okay, using this uh, uh, modified trust, our prediction of the trajectory is better. So we had the idea of how to make the better prediction of the UAV states. So we could get the better answer of where the, where the second UAV will go. But what should we do, even if we know where the second UAV go, to avoid the collision. And answering this question was done with no revolution. So this was the second part of my research as uh, my research in machine learning during my PhD. And the idea was to use evolutionary algorithm, evolutionary strategies to optimize the neural network. So common neural networks have a layered structure. What we have here is a structure which is not so, uh, so standard and traditional. It's not layered. And we use an evolution, evolutionary algorithm or GA here 
to optimize both weight and the topology of the network, which helps us to be more flexible, not getting overfit, and all these issues that we have in machine learning to an extent can be uh, reduced using neuroevolution because we don't need to go with a very huge network. And also we don't need to go through the process of uh, hyperparameter optimization. So these are the main reasons that neuroevolution helps us. And I don't go to the details of neuroevolution. I just wanted to show you how it works. We have some mutation, crossover, all these uh, operators we have in GA. And based on that, we are trying to optimize the neural network. Also, we have some adaptiveness and some internal controller and all this stuff that can be, uh, actually, if you want, you can read in the paper. But all of these things helps us to have a model that's optimal for avoiding the collision. So what we wanted to do is wanted to give both UAV some predefined collision avoidance uh, policies. So if the UAVs fly and have a collision, based on those predefined policies, they can go with different, uh, different strategies, changing their direction or changing their velocity and avoid the collision. And with all of the real, uh, real problems that we have, the sensor uncertainty, the uh, range of sensing and all of this, and with limited communication, instead of allowing the UAVs to send their position, we just allow them to send, okay, I'm going to make this uh, maneuver and you should also do this maneuver uh, coherently. So our optimization, learning, applied, and neuroevolution showed that, okay, initially we needed some radar or some uh, information from the source to find out how to avoid the collision. But by learning and getting more complex network, we came to just sensing by LIDAR and also later just sensing by a camera, which is sufficient for us to avoid the collision. It's actually very important for these UAVs. So this part was the answer of the how to best make the best policies when we have this answer. So for me, uh, machine learning is always a tool, nothing more, nothing, not always even the best tool, but always just a tool to solve a real problem. So what I learned was that there's not any perfect model. There's not even a perfect idea or architecture, or there's not any a way, a perfect way to find the optimal policy or train a model. Everything, every time is a trade-off between learnability and optimality. And also, I, I learned a lot from the other works uh, of how to follow others and um, learn some, some ideas based, based on them, but don't repeat them. And the hardest thing I learned in the hardest way was working with the hardware, which I learned that it's not always fun to do and there's always some error. And as just a suggestion, I, I, I suggest you guys to continue working with control theory, learning control theory as some uh, supporting part, not substitution part for machine learning. And that's all. I thank you again for inviting me. And I also thank for uh, the time I had working in this project with Dr. Rai. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amit. That was really, really nice. So let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Roy Yang. Uh, hi, Professor. Can you give me the, the co host? Okay. So, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Roy Yang, and uh, currently I'm the postdoc at Clemson University in Dr. S. Lab. And today I will briefly introduce one of the projects in my PhD degree, the deep learning architecture for computer vision based structure health monitoring. And uh, uh, so, here is a brief introduction of my background as Dr. Rai already introduced me. So I get my master PhD degree from UB and currently I'm the postdoc in Clemson. And my research focuses on the deep learning autonomous vehicle, the computer vision and ontology. So let's talk about the structured health monitoring project. So structured health monitoring refers to the process of implementing the 
uh, damage detection algorithm for the uh, engineering structures such as the bridges and the buildings. Uh, so traditionally, the the structure health monitoring can be divided into two categories. The first one is the contact method. So we use the attached sensors such as the accelerometer on the surface of the structure. And then the, these sensors can capture the dynamics response and other information. And based on this information, we can do the damage detection. And the second method is non-contact method, which can be the digital image correlation or, the, or we can use the laser Doppler web meter to measure uh, the dynamics response. Uh, however, for the attached sensors, the weight of these sensors will influence the lightweight structures and then cause the error of the measurement. And for the conventional non-contact uh, non method, uh, the high cost of these equipment and the long-term experiment is the main drawbacks for this non-contact method. So in order to address these problems, we want to use the deep learning networks, uh, such as the convolutional neural network, the RSTM, or the temporal convolutional network. Since this, net, since this architecture already shows a good performance for different applications, and they should be used for the uh, feature extraction for the build for, from the video of the structure, and based on these features, we can do the def, uh, damage detection. And uh, you can see for, for this short video, we can see this is the bridge and we can clearly see there is the vibration of the bridges. So based on this video, it should have a lot of valuable information for us to know if there is a damage in this bridge. And uh, so the objective of this project is to uh, build a fully autonomous computer vision based uh, deep learning technique that can skip any image processing, and also it can directly to get uh, uh, the vibration or, or the dynamic response of the structure only from the videos or the images. So first of it, we use a high-speed camera to, to record the, the vibration of the structures, for example, the buildings. Then we get, for example, the buildings or the bridges. Then we can get the videos of the bridges. Next, we extract the uh, the frames from the whole recorded video. Then we fit these frames into the different uh, machine learning or deep learning models to do the damage detection. So here we have the three specific objectives. The first, we can do the model frequency detection. Next, we can do the mode shift detection. And the last, we can do the structure defect detection. And uh, in this presentation, I will briefly talk about the model frequency detection and the structure defect detection. So first is the natural frequency detection. So this is the video we recorded during our experiment. So we can see from this video, it contains the information for the natural frequency information. And this is the two plots for the time domain plot and the, and the frequency domain plot. So the peaks in the nature for the frequency domain plot represent the natural frequency values for these beams. And by monitoring these model frequencies, it will help people to optimize, control, or predict the, the status of the structures during its operation. And uh, this is the whole computational pipeline for the natural frequency detection project. First, we do the shaker-based test. We totally have the six different beams with different materials and the different dimension. We put them on the shaker test bed. And the, at the same time, we use a high-speed camera to record the, the vibration video for each brain. And the next, once we get, uh, uh, next uh, we attach an accelerometer on each beam to record the uh, natural frequency information. Next, we get the spectral plot for each uh, beams. And uh, each peak in the spectral plot represent one natural frequency values. And the next step, we fade the frames from the recorded videos and the corresponding natural frequency values into the proposed CNN LSTM model. And the output of the CNN LSTM model should be the predicted natural frequencies for different beams. And in the CNN LSTM model, the first part is the CNN part. The CNN here is used for 
for the features extraction since our input data is the images. And once we get the features from the scene model, we will fit them into the LSTM model for the sequential data analysis. And the final output should be the natural frequency prediction. And uh, we also use several different metrics to evaluate uh, our model. First is the robustness on noisy data. Uh, for each beams, we recorded uh, several different uh, videos. And uh, during each, and for each video, there is a little difference for the light condition or the background. This information can be regarded as a noisy data. And, uh, and we recorded the four of the four videos of each beam as a training data set, and the rest of one uh, video for each beam as a test data set. Uh, at the same time, we use the uh, analytical and FEA method as a comparison. And uh, from this result, we can see the CNR stand model have the better performance than the analytical and FEA results. So for the Hamilton model idea, uh, here the CNR stand model is our machine learning or deep learning model and analytical FEA is the physics model. So we, uh, one of the, our future work is that we combine these two uh, method together to the physics of the analytical med, uh, model with our deep learning based uh, CNN LSTM model. So this would be the hybrid model for the natural frequency detection. And this is another result for the extrusibility. So from this result, we can see the proposed model also have the better results than the analytical and FEA results. So the second uh, application is for the defect detection. Uh, in the defect detection, we use the uh, transfer uh, function matrix as uh, to to evaluate the defect to evaluate the defect. So the uh, the transfer function matrix is a Fourier transform of the frequency response function. And the de if the defects in structure occurs, the defects will affect the stiffness or the damping properties, which results in the transfer function matrix change and which make it an effective matrix for the defect detection. And in this experiment, uh, we manually to generate the damage on the different beams. So for each material, the naturals are created in the three different location in the beams. And uh, we also keep the last one as a healthy beam for the completion. Uh, next, uh, we, we put all the beams on the vibrant, uh, on the shaker test and uh, we attach the accelerometer to measure the transfer function matrix. So once we get the transfer function matrix, we can get uh, this matrix for the healthy beam and uh, the damaged beam. So also we use the uh, mean absolute error to, as the matrix to, to calculate uh, the difference between the healthy beam and the damaged beam. These values will be the damage indicator factor. And this also be the, this will be the output of our machine learning model to do the damage detection. Uh, so here we use a CNT model to do the uh, DIF prediction compared with RSTM, TCN can have the lower memory requirements and also it can have increased the convolutional layers receptive which can improve the sequential data prediction performance. Uh, so here is the result of the CNT model. Uh, at the same time, we compare the performance of CNT model with the three state of art method, the CNN LSTM model, the CNN by LSTM model, and the multi-scale CNN LSTM model. We also use the two, two metrics, the robustness on noisy data and the extrusibility to evaluate uh, the CNT model. And from results, we can see the CNT model can have the better performance than the three state of the art method. And uh, yeah, this is a brief introduction of my work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roy. Thank you for your nice presentation. So let's move on to the next panelist, uh, Suvendu. Yeah, sure. Can you see my screen? Yes. So hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is name is Shubhendu Singh and I'm going to talk about PyLSTM or the Physics Infused Long Short Term Memory Network, which falls under the purview of a broader domain of hybrid machine learning models. Okay. 
So hybrid models, when we heard this word, the first thing which might come to most people's mind that why in the first place we need a new modeling paradigm when there are tons of existing ones. And the answer is as follows. You know, coming from an engineering background, we all know how important it gets at time to predict the complex system behavior and a multitude of applications in the domains of design and control rely heavily on model availability. And hence there's a dire need for dependable techniques which can help us model the dynamic system behavior under the influence of noisy sensor data and large unstructured space space. At present, there are two primary approaches to modeling, but the problem with the existing machine learning models is that in presence of the scarce data set, they fail to generalize well beyond their seen environment. In addition, this show a complete disregard to the physical laws and underlying principles of the system. On the other hand, the physics-based models are quite difficult to build and rely heavily on domain expertise. And at times, they fail to imitate the exact system behavior which they are supposed to represent. And this happens because of the oversimplifying assumptions made during the development. Let's take the example of this UAV, which is trying to engage multiple targets at a time. And if I were to model this system using physics-based model, the problem is that those equation models could not account for the complex phenomena of air drag and wind turbulence. On the other hand, the problem with the machine learning models is that we do not have that much of real-time data. And if somehow we manage to get that amount of data, most of the time it's corrupt and noisy. And that's where the hybrid models come into picture where we try to overcome the limitations of both the above mentioned approaches by striking a balance between the use of scientific theory and the amount of available data. Since Dr. Rai already presented this key conceptual idea, I will skip through it and try to give a walkthrough of the hybrid PyLSTM model in the context of the inverted pendulum system. People who are coming from the controls background might know that inverted pendulum system is one of the most popular examples of a dynamically unstable system. The problem in modeling the system using physics-based approach is that those models could not account for the complexities of wind speed and air drag, and the additional complexities are further added due to the ground friction. Most of the machine learning approaches such as supervised and the reinforcement learning are computationally very cost inefficient. And that's why we thought of approaching this problem from a hybrid models perspective, where we chose a partial physics model which takes as input the four state space variables and the applied force and the time for application of the force, and in turn produces the output as the subsequent state space of the inverted pendulum system, which are the position of the cart, velocity of the cart, angle of the pendulum, and angular velocity after time t. We went on to produce two partial physics models where the variation was just in terms of the coefficient of friction, and we chose the wind velocity as an average value, which completely differs from the real wind speed. And this in turn resulted in generation of two hybrid models, which we'll term as hybrid one and hybrid two. So this is a complete PyLSTM architecture where we combine the sensor data X1, X2, Xn, along with the output of the partial physics model YP in a manner so as to leverage the data retention capacities of the memory cells and their recurrent processing powers in a manner so as to generate the subsequent state space of the inverted pendulum system denoted by YR. In this PyLSTM architecture, the role of partial physics is to guide the construction and parameter tuning of the LSTM cells. And in turn, the LSTM helps to fill in the details which were missing due to the oversimplifying assumptions of the partial physics model. And hence this uniquely balanced combination of physics and machine learning help us to exploit the underlying spatio-temporal dependencies in the data. Well, these are a couple of our own unique matrices which we came up with to assess the performance of the partial PyLSTM model. And on the left, you can see the generalizability matrix, which refers to the ability of a model to perform well on a data set within its domain range. And on the right, we have this extrapolability matrix, which is basically the measure of a model's predictive accuracy on a data set outside its training domain range. And due to a better quality of physics, you can clearly see that hybrid one outperforms hybrid two and the pure data-driven model. While on the extrapolability metrics, the hybrid two performs worse than the pure data-driven model. And this is one thing which needs to be noted that 
although the physics provides supplementary information, but the poor quality of physics or a low level of data abstraction could lead to an adverse performance of the overall hybrid architecture. On the left, we have a table which presents a comparison between the computational complexity of the hybrid models when compared to the data-driven model. And on the right, we have this robust net matrix which shows how stable a model is when subjected to noisy data set. And if you closely observe both the diagrams, you could find that the hybrid models highly compromise on the computational cost with performance. And the hybrid one clearly outperforms the hybrid two and the pure data-driven model. On the left, we have this regression plot for the purely data-driven model for the four state space variables of the inverted pendulum system. And on the right, we have this regression plot for the hybrid model. And it's clearly evident that the hybrid model outperforms its data-driven counterpart. This is a virtual simulation of the data to show how well hybrid performs in comparison to the data-driven modeling when it comes to balancing the card pool in an inverted pendulum system. So that was our application of PyLSTM in context of the inverted pendulum system. This is another application where PyLSTM is being used for the Scotty project, which is funded by the Office of Naval Research, where we are trying to build a comprehensive software package which performs the autonomous diagnostics, prognostics, and reconfiguration of the faulty subcomponents of a naval ship engine. And the objects labeled as TO1, TO2, and the multi-physics equations constitute the so-called hybrid PyLSTM component of the overall Scotty software package. At moment, we are considering two parallel uh, variants of the hybrid model, the parallel and the sequential variant. This is another application of PyLSTM where we are using this model to reduce the overall specific energy consumption in a high-speed CNC grinding process. This project is being carried on in collaboration with the West Virginia University and Itamco, which is a leading US gear manufacturer. And our target is to increase the overall production efficiency by around five to 7% by just inculcating this PyLSTM model in the overall process flow. So the model is there in the public domain, it's published. If you want to dig deeper into the technicalities, you can check out the paper. And with that, I would like to thank the audiences for being here and passing on the baton back to Dr. Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Suvindu. Um, so we have a um, couple of questions uh, from the audience. Um, you know, both are geared towards Suvindu. So let me you know, praise them. Um, so one of the questions is like, can a hybrid neural network model be applied to spatiotemporal problems in fluid and thermal domain or in multi-physics applications and stuff like that. Can you apply uh, a hybrid physics guided machine learning approach there? So, yeah, I mean, I think if, let's say if we take the example of uh, thermal fluidic applications, and if we have the variables such as pressure difference, temperature or heat flux, and we can, and we have the equations for heat conduction or the navier stoke, and then we can uh, model them in the same manner how I model the state space equations for the inverted pendulum system. Yeah, so the answer is that, yeah, definitely we can use the hybrid models for spatiotemporal problems and fluid and thermal domain. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Subhendu. I think the second question is uh, related, so we'll leave, leave that because, you know, it's, it's the same question. Uh, and, you know, what I want to do is a quick switch on some very general question that audience of uh, the webinar series uh, has. And one of the questions they have um, is typically you have been in the machine learning and data science field. Um, what according to you are good attributes of a data scientist or machine? Zeebo, any perspective on that? Uh, I think the most of the basic thing is the coding, coding skill. Uh, yeah, we have to, no matter what kind of language, uh, Python, MATLAB, Java, C++, at least they need to uh, very familiar with one of them so that you can uh, do the others. Second one is some of the uh, deep learning based uh, packages like Tensor, no matter TensorFlow or uh, PyTorch, this kind of thing. I think third skill is about the 
uh, data science. You have to be able to process the data to figure out the feature in the data, uh, which need some of the statistic knowledge. Yeah, I think these three are the basic uh, skills. Thank you. Uh, anything that you want to add, Amir, to this? Uh, I, I, I think you should, if you, if you want to do research in data science and machine learning as fundamental research, you should also have background in optimization and probability theory. Uh, but what Zeebo said is completely true. If you want to use these tools, you must be able to code very well. Okay. Uh, Rui, Suvendu, any perspective on this one? Yeah. Rui, you can go ahead. Oh, okay, yeah, I totally agree with what Zebo and Amir said. The coding uh, ability and also you need to have the background and uh, of the optimization. And in addition, I think you also should uh, have the the problem identification and the uh, serviceability. Since once you face the problem, for example, the structure health monitoring or the inverted pendulum, so since we already have the lots of different architecture for the deep learning, so if you have the background of the, uh, the literature review search and also you know some the current architecture of the deep learning, so you are easy to find a suitable architecture to serve this problem. Yeah. Yeah. So so I summarize these attributes in terms of three A's. The first is analytical skills. So how you approach a problem and how we analyze the data. That's the first step. And the second A is for algorithmic approach. If someone is able to come up with his own set of algorithms to solve a problem, then coding is just about you know, writing a couple of lines of syntax to communicate with the machine. And the third and the most important thing is adaptability. So the field is evolving so fast, so we should always be on our toes and open to learning new ideas. Yeah, so these are the three A's, analytical skills, algorithmic approach, and adaptability to the new ideas. Thank you for your perspective on this uh, question. Um, you know, one of the other things uh, that we want to do is uh, show and high, highlight the different career paths that you have chosen. And, you know, you all started as a you know, PhD student and now we have branched out to do different things right now. So can you, each of you tell a little bit more about your journey of how you started and how you arrived at your current job that involves machine learning and data science. Zebo? <laughs> okay, actually, uh, since I'm in your lab, right, you know that. Uh, so before, actually before my master degree, in my bachelor degree, I almost uh, uh, do not know how to code. Although we have some of the courses, but it's just uh, learn something, but never practice them. And uh, start from the uh, my master and in uh, in your lab, and I I learn some coding. Like I, I start from MATLAB actually, and later on I learned Java, uh, which is a uh, 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 a little bit improved. And uh, I learned Python. Python, Python is a pretty similar uh, as MATLAB. Um, and my first project is about deep learning, right? Before that, I never touched this. And I think this one is more promising. And uh, I uh, try to learn something, learn different networks and learn how to process the data. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, uh, one important thing is about the image processing, right? Image processing is involved, I think it, it should involve in uh, data processing uh, or the data science rather than the machine learning parts. Um, after I learned this kind of thing, practice several of the uh, project, I, I think I got the skill and uh, I tried to uh, have an interview with KLA and they do need this kind of skills, which involves coding and uh, uh, data processing. Uh, and uh, I, they hire me. Yeah. And I uh, actually, in my current job, I don't need to learn uh, too much new things. I can easily handle them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
Amen. Yeah, my, my background was very, very different. I was mostly in a biomechanical engineering. And when I came to PhD, I, I wasn't in machine learning and data science. So what I can say is that everything you are going to do in your PhD, I think it's a acceptable assumption that you have time and also the resources to learn it. So don't worry about changing the topic so much. Um, so my, my my acquaintance with machine learning is mostly from the optimization side. So I came from that side to here instead of the uh, data science directly. And right now I'm working mostly on modeling for uh, my postdoc in Purdue. So uh, I, I think as long as you're open to learning new things, everything can go in your favor one way or another. Thank you, Amir. So you, do you have any perspective? Uh, yeah, so my experience may be a little similar as Zebo, since we all have the bachelor degree of the traditional mechanical engineering, so we don't have too much skills about the coding, only a little MATLAB. And for the master degree, after I finish my first project about the IPU manufacturing, so I start working on the uh, machine learning project. So the first uh, machine learning project is the acoustic de uh, uh, detection part that for the that is for the uh, manufacturing domain. And uh, after this project, I participated in several different uh, projects about the deep learning, like the satellite image uh, detection and also this structure health monitoring. And uh, based on this experience, I learned a lot of the coding uh, skills and uh, also know how to solve the different problems. And uh, currently, in for my postdoc uh, 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 position, it's a little different from what I did in a PhD degree. Since in PhD degree, uh, most uh, students, they, they will specifically do a specific uh, problem. So you need to do the whole process of the one project from the data collection and also the experiment uh, design. And also you need a coding by yourself and the next last you will uh, get a result. Uh, but for the postdoc, it's a little different. Since for the postdoc, uh, now more than half of my time is focused on the proposal thing. Since now you need to have the more high level thoughts about how to solve the problem instead of only to serve the specific problem. So that, that is a different from the postdoc and the PhD students in my opinion. Thank you, Subindu. So I was always interested in like computer science and mathematics, and I come from a C++ Java background. And somehow like I ended up doing mechanical engineering. And then after my bachelor's, when I got this opportunity to be a part of Dr. Raz's lab, uh, I got this thing to bring together my engineering background and computer science together and do this noble research. Yeah, that's how I find my way into this position where I'm doing research with Dr. Ray. Thank you. I would like to thank all my panelists for spending very valuable time with us and sharing their experiences, their research insight with all the attendees that we have. And with that, I want to once again announce that next week we will have another webinar and the focus topic of that webinar will be engineering design. And we have three outstanding speakers uh, for that webinar. So I will encourage you to join that webinar too. With that, once again, thank you everyone for participation and have a great day. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye.